Hi, I'm Dr. Keith Volstad. And I'm Laura McLeod Volstad of Volstad Chiropractic and Integrated Wellness. We'd like to welcome you to this week's edition of the Chiropractic Corner, a weekly show spotlighting the chiropractic profession and what doctors of chiropractic do to improve their patients' health. In this program, Dr. Volstad and I plan to cover topics that pertain to your health from a complementary and alternative medicine point of view. These topics will include spinal injury issues like neck pain, low back pain, bulging discs, pinched nerves, and sports injuries, lifestyle medicine, dietary and nutritional advice, nutraceuticals, and supplementation, just to name a few. We'd like to encourage you to email us about topics that you'd like to hear discussed on this program. You can do that by emailing us at imchiro1, the number one, at gmail.com. That's I am as in Mary, C-H-I-R-O, the number one, at gmail.com. Today we'd like to talk about our necks and how painful they can sometimes be. Many of us have neck pain and maybe don't have a very good understanding as to why our neck might hurt. Doc, what can you tell us about the neck? Your neck. What a pain in the neck. (laughs) Your neck, also called the cervical spine, uh, begins at the base of your skull and goes to where it meets your back. It also contains seven vertebrae or bones. These vertebrae have intervertebral discs between them. And what is an intervertebral disc? An intervertebral disc is a structure that sits between the vertebrae and your spine. It's kind of like a hockey puck. It has a very tough outer fibrous covering with a little bit of a filling, like a gelatinous filling that we call the nucleus pulposus. And the term intervertebral means that it's between the vertebrae. In addition to the discs, the spine has the seven vertebrae with associated joints, as well as muscles and ligaments. These structures are very important, and it's important to understand how they play into the root of neck pain, and we will talk about them, but maybe a little later. The shape of these cervical vertebrae is unique and account for the great flexibility that we have in our necks. Hmm. These bones allow us to turn our head up to 80 to 90 degrees from side to side, and they allow us to flex and extend our heads forwards and back so that we can look up and down, and also to bend our heads from side to side. In addition, we can combine any or all of these motions at one time. Think about how important this is to being able to see and hear and smell the world around you. For example, driving your car, being able to turn your head to see what, what's coming and where you're going, or this, to turn your head and be able to smell something and determine where that smell is coming from. All of these things are all, uh, allowed because of the flexibility of our neck. This same spine also houses the spinal cord, which is the extension of from your brain that goes down into your body in the spine itself. This spinal cord sends off roots that exits the spinal column through openings between the vertebrae. These openings are called intervertebral foramina. And Laura, there you go again (laughs) with that intervertebral word, which definitely does mean between the vertebrae. I was going to ask you about foramina. Foramina basically (laughs) is is a word that simply means whole. So Uh, what we're talking about here is a hole between the vertebrae. It's interesting to note, though, that other things pass through these holes, things like blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, as well as other smaller nerves. hmm. It's incredible that this cervical spine supports the full weight of your head, which on average is about 12 pounds. While this uh, spine can move your head in nearly every direction, This flexibility, though, does make the neck very susceptible to pain and injury. So it's really true. There's a veritable bowling ball sitting on your shoulders. That's exactly right. If you think about the weight of your head compared to a bowling ball, it's pretty close. And we we know how heavy a bowling ball can be. (laughs) I don't even think I can pick up a 12-pound bowling ball. (laughs) Well, you're carrying around one on top of your neck, that's for sure. The way the neck works is called biomechanics. And it's this biomechanical ability that makes the neck susceptible to injury. Hmm. Activities and events that affect the mechanics or biomechanics of the cervical spine would include things like extended sitting, 
repetitive movement, accidents, falls, blows to the body or head, just the normal aging process and everyday wear and tear. Neck pain can be very bothersome or painful, and it can have a variety of causes. I think it's interesting to learn how the neck is put together. I don't think uh, many of us think about that very often, and I know we certainly don't think about that column supporting a bowling ball on top of our shoulders. So I'm surprised we don't see a whole lot more um, of that type of injury. Um, in your career, Doc, I, I know you've seen a lot of neck injury. What, what are the, some of the more common causes of neck pain that you've, that you've seen? Well, it's interesting to note that the weight of your head certainly does come into play. That's an interesting thing that you picked up on there, Laura. Hmm. But some of the more common causes, I'm going to mention three of them. Well, there's injury and accidents, you know, a sudden force and movement of the head or neck in any direction and the resulting rebound in the opposite direction. And that's commonly known as whiplash, something you might get from a car accident or even a slip and fall. Another cause could be just growing older. Mm. As we grow older, we have degenerative processes such as osteoarthritis, spinal stenosis, and that intervertebral disc. It can degenerate as well, and these things greatly affect the spine and can certainly result in neck pain. We've said another thing here that we're not sure what it means, stenosis. Stenosis what, what is, is a, that? A stenosis is a word that basically means narrowing, mm. and the spinal canal itself can narrow, which can certainly cause patients a lot of pain. Why would it do that? That's an interesting question. I think the most common cause might be inflammation. Mm. Um, maybe injury as well, but, uh, for whatever reason, the narrowing of the spine can be very painful for the patient. Another cause, and this is the one where patients can come in and say, well, you know, doc, I really didn't do anything. I just woke up and I, my neck's hurting. It's just that it's the result of daily living, the poor posture we have at work or at home. As I sit up straight in my chair here. Yes, we, so often we don't sit up straight, and we don't sit up straight for long periods of time. It's hard to remember. Yes, maintaining good posture is a discipline, and it does require some habit-forming activities so that we can remember to sit up straight. Mm. Another thing that can result in neck pain from our daily life is just being overweight. Sometimes that extra weight can put a real strain on the musculature of our upper back and neck and result in neck pain. Weak abdominal muscles can also cause neck pain. Interestingly enough, these weak abdominal muscles can disrupt our spinal balance. This causing our neck to bend forward in compensation, resulting in an undue stress and strain on the muscles in our upper back and neck, causing some neck pain. And, of course, there's that stress and emotional tension. Mm -hmm. This tension can cause our muscles to tighten, cause them to contract, and this can result in pain and stiffness. Postural stress can contribute to chronic neck pain with symptoms extending into the upper back and then also radiating into the arms. Let's talk about some additional conditions, Doc, that could result from neck pain and injury. I know there are lots of them. Uh, can you share with our listeners about some of the more common conditions people may experience they might, may or may not know come from the neck? I sure can, but let me first say that there are many very serious injuries that can occur in the cervical region that are life-threatening. Hmm. Things such as fractures, spinal cord injuries, compression injuries, all of these things can result in some kind of paralysis. These injuries are medical emergencies and require emergency medical treatment. What I'm going to talk about, though, are the non-emergency conditions that we all experience from time to time. You ever had that pain radiating into the upper shoulder regions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, very commonly <laughs> that occurs after sitting at the desk working on the computer or writing for long periods of mm -hmm. times. What's happening is the muscles in the upper back and the neck kind of go into a state of spasm, resulting in the formation of what are known as trigger points. Those are those points that if you push on them, they really, really hurt. And these trigger points can become bad enough that they'll actually cause you to have some neck pain and maybe even some headache. Then we have what's called brachial neuralgia or neuritis. Brachial neuralgia is basically a numbness and tingling 
or a weakness or pain that can radiate down the path of the brachial nerve, which is the ner- a nerve that runs from your neck down into your arm and hand. A very, very painful circumstance, and it usually indicates that the injury is a little bit worse than just a simple muscular or ligamentous injury in the neck. So if I'm experiencing numbness and tingling in my hands or pain in my hands, it could be coming from my neck? That is true. It could very well be coming from your neck. So it is certainly something to be concerned about and to have checked out. Another condition that patients have that come from the neck, and they may not realize it, is a headache. There are many, many causes of headache. However, there are muscular headaches or tension headaches resulting from those trigger points that we talked about earlier. Another source of the headache is what I like to call the greater occipital nerve syndrome. What's that? The greater occipital nerve is a nerve that exits the upper cervical spine and supplies your scalp radiating or going all the way over your top of your head to just over your eyes. And sometimes with muscle spasms of those muscles that are between the skull and the top of your cervical spine, that nerve can become compromised, resulting in headache or pain that would radiate from the base of your skull over the top of your head over the front of your eyes. That headache could also be caused by someone who enjoyed their Friday night too much, maybe. Absolutely too good of a Friday night. (laughs) Another condition that's very common in the neck are herniated discs. Those intervertebral discs that we talked about earlier can become bulging, and we call that a herniated disc. And these injuries are most commonly very painful, Mm -hmm. something that needs to be attended to. Another common disorder that patients have in their neck is osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is a progressive deterioration of the cartilage of the joints in your neck, and the body reacts by forming bone spurs, and this affects joint motion. Hmm, bone spurs. Doc, you know, we hear that a lot. Um, what exactly is a bone spur? Can you explain it? So, Is it something you can feel? Would you know that you have one? A bone spur is the body's attempt to strengthen an attachment Hmm. between a bone and a ligament or a tendon. So is it scar tissue? No, it's actually a lay down of bony material. Sometimes people will just say calcium, Uh. but a bony material to re-strengthen that attachment of the soft tissue to the bone. And it very commonly looks like a little hook or a little uh, claw. And on an x-ray, it's very, very easy to see. And we give that the term a bone spur. That doesn't sound like it feels very good to have a claw or a hook somewhere where it's not supposed to be. Well, certainly it can create some pain. But I also have to admit there are patients that have these spurs and don't have any pain at all. Hmm. So it's not always a painful circumstance. All right. Another condition is something we had mentioned earlier, and that's spinal stenosis. Which means what, Laura? It means narrowing, right? That's right. It means narrowing. And you can have a stenosis in the intervertebral foramen, another term that we used earlier to describe the holes in between the vertebrae. And this narrowing can result in a compression and trapping of the nerve roots that exit these holes. And that can account for a lot of shoulder and arm pain as well as numbness and other neurological symptoms that radiate down the arm into the hand. The last one I'd like to mention is degenerative disc disease. As we age or as a result of continuing, continuous, I should say, injury, the disc can become degenerated, and in doing so, it loses its elasticity and also reduces the height of the disc between the vertebrae, so you will actually shrink a little bit. It's not uncommon for older patients to come in and say, you know, Doc, I used to be 5'10", now I'm only 5'8", 5'8 and a half. How did I lose this height? Well, as we look at their spine on an x-ray, we can see that the disc has degenerated and has uh, lost some of its height, and so the patient ends up losing some of their height. 
Oh, you covered lots of pain in the neck opportunities, but um, we mentioned accidents before. Can we talk a little bit about and be a little more specific about what happens to a person's neck when they're involved, um, let's say, in a car accident? Because that's when you hear the word whiplash offered up most commonly. Can we talk about that? Sure, sure. Car accidents can be a real pain in the neck, as you just mentioned. The mechanism of a car accident is rather interesting, and a, re- a lot of research has gone into trying to discover exactly what happens to a person's cervical spine when they're involved in a car accident. Let's say they get hit from behind, or they rear end somebody. The mechanism of this injury is not exactly what most people think. I believe that most people think that what happens is their head gets whipped forward and then back. And sure enough, that does occur. But that is not the first thing that occurs when a patient's involved in these types of accidents. The first thing that occurs is a compression of the cervical spine. And this event is what creates a lot of the disc injuries that patients have from a car accident. The compression of the spine in a downward motion causes the intervertebral disc to be squeezed and results very commonly in that bulging or herniation of the disc. Then you have your forward and or back hyperflexion extension events which result can result in joint irritation soft tissue injuries and if it's severe enough certainly could result in some kind of uh, fracture when you said flexion and extension are you talking about when your chin hits your chest and then back to the headrest in that rapid motion that's what you mean by flexion and extension that's exactly what i'm talking about and that's what we commonly see on those commercials where they show in slow motion the dummy inside of a car Mm -hmm. when the car hits something and is stopped very suddenly you see that whipping of the head in a forward motion and then getting whipped back in a backward motion um, and that's what I, exactly what I'm talking about. Ew, that hurts just thinking about it. <laughs> yes, it is a very painful circumstance. This uh, sudden whipping motion then, as I mentioned, can injure the surrounding and supporting tissues of the neck and the head. And then the muscles react by tightening and contracting. Uh, we call that muscle spasm, and eventually the muscles will tend to fatigue, and that results in pain and stiffness. This pain is a result of the fact that the fatigued muscles can't support the head. Many patients will comment about, boy, my head sure feels heavy. This severe whiplash can also be associated with injury to the joints, intervertebral joints and ligaments and nerve roots. And that's why very commonly patients are very, very stiff, especially when they get up in the morning. Um, And the nerve roots can result in numbness and tingling and pain going down the arm and the hand. Uh, Car accidents are the most common cause of, quote-unquote, whiplash. Mm -hmm. And research has clearly demonstrated that the speed of the accident isn't always the most important factor in determining the severity of injury to the neck. Ah, yeah, people involved in car accidents, and and we just had one recently, um, um, you know, even those minor fender benders may not feel they injured themselves at all. When their car's hardly injured, they go, well, you know, nothing happened to my car. Guess I'm okay, too. Uh, But we just recently had someone come in whose wife kicked him in the door because a couple of days later, he started to complain about, you know, stiffness that he doesn't ordinarily have you know, when we see him. That's right. And that's an interesting point that you just made. It is important to understand that you may not feel the discomfort or pain from an accident like this for several days. So don't be misled thinking that you're not injured just because you don't have pain immediately following the accident. Give yourself 48 to 72 hours and don't be surprised if you develop some discomfort or pain during that time frame. Now that we've laid out some of the more common causes of neck pain, how do chiropractic physicians diagnose the different causes of neck pain? That is the important task at hand. Uh, During your initial visit, 
we will do several things to try and locate the source of your pain. And we'll also ask you questions about how your current symptoms started and what remedies you may have already tried. For example, when did the pain start? What have you done for your neck pain? Does the pain radiate or travel to other parts of the body? Does anything reduce the pain or does something make it worse? After these questions are answered, we then might do a physical and a neurological exam. In your physical exam, we will observe your posture, test your range of motion, uh, noting the movement and the movements that cause pain. We will look at your spine, touch it and feel it, note its curvature and alignment, and feel for those muscle spasm and nasty trigger points that we talked about earlier. A check of your shoulder area would also be in order because of these trigger points. During the neurological exam, we will test your reflexes, test the strength of your muscles, and also look at other potential nerve changes that you may have told us about, numbness and tingling. We also do an orthopedic evaluation. These, this evaluation would include specific tests of function to determine what structures might be involved in this injury. In some instances, then, subsequent to this exam, we will order other tests. An x-ray, for example, which would show that narrow to disc space, if you have that, or potential fractures or bone spurs or an arthritic condition. Uh, a CT scan, a computerized axial tomography scan, or a magnetic resonance imaging test, also known as an MRI, are very useful in determining and showing bulging discs and herniations. If we suspect that there has been damage to a nerve, we may order a special test called an electromyography or an EMG. And this test measures how quickly your nerves respond to a stimulus. And if it's outside of the normal range, then it demonstrates to us that these nerves may potentially be damaged. We chiropractic physicians are conservative care doctors. Our scope of practice does not allow us to include drugs or surgery. So if we would happen to diagnose a condition that would require drugs or surgery, such as a neck fracture or an indication of some spinal cord injury, please remember we will refer you to the appropriate medical physician or specialist. We may also ask for permission to talk about this condition with your family physician so that we can ensure that your care with us is coordinated with the care that you may be receiving from your medical doctor. Thanks, Doc. Now that you've diagnosed the condition causing the neck pain, what treatments would you commonly use for patients who have that neck pain? The treatments that we would commonly use for patients who have neck pain were treatments that we discussed in the last edition of the Chiropractic Corner. Things such as spinal manipulation, which is the mainstay of chiropractic care. We'd also utilize physical therapies, Things such as EMS and interferential current, ice, heat, things that are very important for the reduction of inflammation and pain. We might utilize myofascial release technique or massage therapy to deal with those nasty trigger points that we had commented about earlier. We would also utilize mechanical traction, including something called a spinal decompression, which is very helpful for patients who have cervical disc injuries. We also might utilize cold laser therapy, which is a newer therapy that research has shown is very beneficial for soft tissue injuries. We also might use ultrasound. And lastly, I'd like to mention that we might also use nutritional supplements. Nutritional supplements are very helpful for patients who have inflammation as we can naturally reduce their inflammatory process, reducing the needs for medications. And also, we want to make sure that your body has the building blocks it needs to perform the repairs. And we get those building blocks through what we eat and through nutrition. Once the patient starts feeling some better, then we would add in rehabilitative exercises and stretching. Exercise is very important to facilitate the repair of the soft tissue structures of your neck so that as to reduce stiffness and inflexibility and to reduce the permanency of this injury. Doc, what happens when someone gets injured in the evening or on a weekend and they can't come right into their chiropractor's office? What should they do in the meantime to help alleviate some of their pain or is there anything they can do um, before they can get to us? 
absolutely a great question. Uh, one of the most important things that I would recommend a patient do in, under those circumstances is to use ice. Do not use heat. Why? Ice will help reduce your pain and reduce inflammation, where oh. heat may actually increase your inflammation and over the longer term cause more injury and more discomfort for you. Mm. So please remember, folks, use ice at home. And if you think it's a medical emergency, then certainly go to the emergency room at the hospital. Okay, folks, there you have it. Neck Pain 101. I hope this was informative for you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to give our office a call at 561-746-4242. And we're also located at 275 Tony Pena Drive, right here in Jupiter. Feel free to stop by at any time. We'd love to meet with you. And now, on to the tip of the week. If you're a golfer, make sure that when you're warming up, you swing the golf club in both directions. This gets the entire musculature of your back and body involved and will increase your flexibility and reduce your risk of injury. Okay, Laura, thanks for your help in putting together this edition of the Chiropractic Corner. My pleasure. I've really enjoyed talking with, with you and with our listeners, and I hope they'll join us again for our next edition of the Chiropractic Corner. And don't forget or be shy about letting us know what topics you'd like to learn more about by emailing us at I, M as in Mary, C-H-I-R-O, the number one, at gmail.com. Or by calling our office at 746-4242. Join us next weekend on Saturday and Sunday morning, right after the 1030 news for another edition of the Chiropractic Corner, right here on the Jupe, WJUP 103.9 FM. Until then, be well, live well.